Hello and welcome to The Insider. I'm Lisa Adams. Welcome to our viewers and to our listeners on the radio. We're continuing today with our somewhat COVID-19 focused editions of the program, but today it is all about what's happening at the National Comedy Center in Jamestown, New York, how the museum has weathered the pandemic and what's on the horizon for their future. My guest today is Journey Gunderson, Executive Director of the National Comedy Center. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So when the Comedy Center opened in 2018, it made quite a splash, but you personally have made quite a splash as well, recognized for the state of the art design and interactivity of the museum, named one of the top 50 museum influencers in the world. And you're also the director of the Lucille Ball Desi Arnaz Museum and on Buffalo Business's first top 40 under 40. So wow, how does all that attention feel? Oh, it feels, uh maybe less than deserved by me as an individual because it's a team effort. Everything that's happened in Jamestown with the National Comedy Center and uh, the Lucille Ball Desiarnez Museum is the result of an effort that took a lot of people in uh, our staff and in the community of Jamestown and in the comedy world coast to coast to make it happen and to make it this successful. So it's flattering and humbling. Certainly a lot of, as you said, planning and teamwork went into creating and designing the museum. It has received so much attention itself, but take us back to the beginning. Remind us how it all started. This was really Lucille Ball's vision for her own hometown, right? Yes. Officials from Jamestown in the late 80s approached Lucille Ball and said, you know, we've been remiss in not celebrating your legacy in a bigger way. We'd like to build a museum about you. And she said, rather than just uh, my stuff in glass cases or I love Lucy nostalgia and, and focus on that part of my legacy. She said, make Jamestown, my hometown, a destination for the celebration and study of all comedy. No one has done that before. And, you know, she lived it and, and believed it uh, wholeheartedly that comedy was so important in people's lives, but also had never really been treated uh, on level with other Tra traditional or classical art forms. And so it was really her idea to create a place where people could come and learn about the craft of comedy and celebrate it and where its heritage would be preserved for generations to come. And what a terrific idea she had there. So for people who haven't had a chance to visit the museum, I was blessed to be able to be there at the beginning when, when you were launching. But we have a little video and we can show people a walkthrough and talk about what's unique about the visitor experience here. Well, one thing we learned from producing the Lucille Ball Comedy Festival in Jamestown for years is that comedy is very personal, right? So everyone has a different taste. So the very first step in the museum, which you can see here, is that each visitor completes a sense of humor profile where you just tap things that you find funny. People, television shows, films, uh, different forms of comedy. That information is loaded onto a wristband, an RFID chip that allows the exhibits throughout your stay to be responsive to your sense of humor and introduce you to artists perhaps of another era that may share a trait in common with someone you indicated that you are you know, currently engaged with in a comedy sense. So this is about making connections so that you know, somebody who loves political comedy or Stephen Colbert understands the legacy of someone like Mort Saul from another generation. And so it's really interactive. Above all, it's fun. Um, it's something where visitors have often said, I did not expect to laugh for four hours at a museum, but I just did and I loved it. So it's, it's a really fun interactive place. Of course, we know some of that interactivity has changed a little bit because of COVID-19. We'll get to that a little bit later on in the program, but talk about the biggest challenges you faced getting this off the ground. Well, we knew from the onset that Jamestown is not Los Angeles, Chicago, or New York. Um, but in many ways, that's part of the strength here. It's a destination, and uh, it's something where people often allow one or two hours, and then they show up on site, and they end up spending four or five hours and leave saying, I should have planned one or two days. That's how much is within the museum, and that speaks to the depth of these exhibits. So I, I would say the hardest part of it was the breadth of the subject matter. You know, to celebrate and study and present the story of comedy uh, is pretty broad. And so I, I'm thrilled above all that comedic artists themselves and the comedy community uh, has been extremely pleased with it. 
uh, from arts and culture critics who review museums all over the world uh, to the comedy community to average Joe American comedy consumer or tourist, everybody has given it high marks and that's what makes me, that, that, that's a sense of relief because this was uh, never an easy project. And it is nonprofit and it's really a, a cultural institution as you said. We, we maybe didn't think of comedy as an art form but it certainly is. That's right. We kind of took the approach of an art museum that uh, let's let the comedic bodies of work and the artists behind them uh, be on display and showcased and valued and appreciated for what they are and what they were. And, um, you know, we're always introducing people to artists of another generation. And I think there's something important about that. Comedic artists should not be forgotten by future generations because of the important role that their work has played in the fabric of our culture. Exactly. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the awards that the National Comedy Center has won, and also about the recent news that Carl Reiner's archives are going to be housed there. Stay with us. I'm Lisa Adams. Welcome back to The Insider. I'm so privileged to have as my guest today, Journey Gunderson, Executive Director of the National Comedy Center in Jamestown, New York. So our TV station did a whole program on the opening of the Comedy Center back in 2018. You know, you're in our backyard, but the national attention and the accolades that were going on even before you opened, just incredible. And then USA Today naming you best new museum in the country, Time Magazine, one of the world's greatest places. I mean, how about that? And has that brought visitors from far and wide to Jamestown, in including, as you mentioned, comedians, big names themselves? Yes. Uh, you know, I think it's something where we were so excited last March to be named the best new museum in the country. Uh, and with that momentum, it was heartbreaking timing to have to close our doors during the pandemic. Um, and that was, you know, on the heels of being named to Time Magazine's World's Greatest Places list. But I'm just thrilled at those third party acknowledgements of the quality of the museum because I can tell everyone what I think is special about what's in those um, galleries and in those exhibits, but to have the third party uh, acknowledgement that also includes how kid friendly it is. You know, we didn't build the museum to be a children's museum by any means. And in fact, we wanted to primarily do justice to the subject matter. And so we really didn't want to censor the very thing we were celebrating. So the lower level of the museum, there's a, a floor below the main floor, it's called the Blue Room, and that's a completely uncensored experience in comedy. But that way, it can be uh, enjoyed by families with school-aged children, and uh, at the same time, enjoyed by those who want to see you know, everything that comedy has ever done in terms of pushing the boundaries, which is a really important story of comedy. Uh, we were thrilled that Western New York Family Magazine named us a must-see destination for families with school-aged children. We were named also one of the uh, most, one of the best family-friendly indoor activities in New York State. And so there really is, it sounds cliche, but there is something for everyone of all age and all taste. And uh, it's, it's been very rewarding to um, garner those accolades. Well, you talked about the importance of younger generations being introduced to older comedians or styles of comedy. And so uh, the recent news that Carl Reiner's archives will be housed there. Why is that important? What's all included in that archive and when can it be seen? It is so important when you're telling the story of comedy to be able to explore a comedic legacy and archive of someone like Carl Reiner. He did pretty much everything within the art form that one could do, um, from performing comedy to writing comedy, writing for television, writing and directing in film, uh, live performances, of course, with, with great collaborators like Mel Brooks and The 2,000-Year-Old Man, which then, of course, was uh, an album form. So he's a real Renaissance man of the art form. And that's why this particular archive is so important to the museum. Uh, people can explore uh, 
uh, his handwritten annotations on the scripts from the Dick Van Dyke show, but also from films like The Jerk with Steve Martin. Uh, so Carl Reiner is special also because he was part of our National Comedy Center Advisory Board. He believed in the mission. He had as much respect for fellow comedic artists as people had for him. Uh, he made everyone around him better. And that's a story that's unique to comedy, that comedy uh, so many times is really about playing off a partner. Uh, and we see that in all of Carl's work. And he was one of the best at it. Absolutely. And also Johnny Carson, uh, an exhibit on Johnny Carson. And that's coming in 2022? Uh, yes, both the uh, Reiner exhibit. The Reiner exhibit is timed with his centennial year of 2022. And then Johnny Carson will also be celebrating in 2022, uh, which is um, <clears throat> 30 years of late night, 30 years later after his retirement. And so Johnny Carson is another figure where it is almost difficult to describe or quantify the magnitude of his impact on comedy. Via Johnny Carson uh, and his show, we, America was introduced to some of the best stand-up comedians of all time. And Johnny Carson had a way of using, you know, he sort of embodies using humor to help people just get through the day. Mm -hmm. He was there for us every night for 30 years. And so that impact will be uh, challenging to communicate in exhibit form, but it helps to have his archives right there with his handwritten notes on his monologues. Um, so it's a really exciting legacy to tell the story of. Absolutely. And so self-deprecating uh, Carson was sometimes <clears throat> yeah. and willing to try just about anything. So I remember Floyd Turbo. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, in a very different humor vein, you've talked about children and how child friendly this is. Fozzie Bear is an exhibit that you have right now. This is just another example of how you include every type of humor for all ages here, waka waka. <laughs> <laughs> Great delivery of the waka waka waka. Um, yeah, so Fozzie Bear, I mean, he is uh, the, the resident stand-up struggling comedian from The Muppets Show. And so The Muppets Show's legacy in comedy and Fozzie's legacy within that, uh, it's, it brings a smile to my face to see visitors multi-generationally reacting to seeing Fozzie on display. This is an original Muppet uh, from the 1978 to 1984 era of The Muppet Show. And I was personally very excited about it. My children were excited about it. My parents were excited about it. And Frank Oz, who developed, performed, voiced, really created this character, um, you know, he said it's, it's, he's been to the National Comedy Center and said he thought it was just wonderful that we're celebrating and highlighting Fozzie in this way. And, uh, you know, this is an example of uh, something where it brought joy to people's lives and continues to through this day. And so we're thrilled to have Fozzie now in our galleries for the year. And I think the Muppets, uh, a really interesting thing all the way around. I mean, I said children when I talked about Fozzie, but the Muppet Show really had humor that appealed to kids watching and their parents watching as well, and Fozzie Bear certainly part of all of that. That's right. All right, it's kind of a downer to talk about COVID-19 when we're talking about humor, but when we come back, we'll talk about how the National Comedy Center handled and is handling that. Stay with us. I'm Lisa Adams. Welcome back to The Insider. We're talking with Journey Gunderson, Executive Director of the National Comedy Center. So navigating COVID-19, how did you handle it at first? You mentioned being completely shut down for a time. And how are you handling things now? Well, during the first 24 hours of the temporary shutdown last March, the staff and we all met and said, regardless of what the baseline CDC guidelines might be, we really need to go above and beyond to make sure people feel comfortable, relaxed, and safe if they're ever going to be able to walk through our museum and laugh. So we worked directly hand in hand with epidemiologists and medical professionals to revamp what is one of the most interactive museums anywhere in the world for the COVID era. So. Um, what the result of that work is a program called Laugh Safe. Uh, each visitor to the National Comedy Center, and we are reopened, uh, now gets a Laugh Safe kit. 
And we encourage reservations in advance at ComedyCenter.org, which helps us stagger the visitation and facilitate the social distancing. Um, we do allow for walk-ups, but no matter what, we're making sure that you are not um, ever forced to be within any close proximity to other parties while you're there. Uh, you get your own um, set of headphones, your own personal stylist, so it is a touch-free experience now. Uh, so these health and safety protocols have been called uh, by the Director of Epidemiology at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh, a superlative approach to keeping people safe. So again, we work directly with medical professionals and epidemiologists to make this safe. Well, some great video we're seeing there of how this no touch emphasis works, as you said, a real change from what the philosophy of the museum was, but it looks as if it's working really well. You also added a National Comedy Center Anywhere online platform as well. So talk about how that works and what's involved in that. Sure, so during our temporary closure, we realized we really needed to continue our mission online and um, communicate the story of comedy to people who could only access it from home. So we launched National Comedy Center Anywhere. There is a portion of content that's available to anyone for free, uh, which is really fantastic content. And then there's also uh, additional content available to members, uh, or you can just buy a subscription to Comedy Center Anywhere. And then we produced the uh, Lucille Ball Virtual Comedy Festival uh, last year during, of course, the summer of the pandemic, again, to try to continue this, this mission online. Yeah, so that virtual Lucy Festival, what all was included in that? And, and did people log on and participate? It was incredible. Uh, you know, the Associated Press covered it, and, and, and so it was syndicated and shared with people coast to coast. It included people like Deborah Messing and Jay Leno, uh, Tiffany Haddish, and others in conversation about the craft of comedy. Uh, so this gave us an opportunity and a silver lining to the, to the temporary closure last summer was that we were able to engage in more in-depth conversations about comedy. I mean, Kenan Thompson uh, is now the longest running cast member on Saturday Night Live, and uh, it was really an important opportunity to explore various perspectives on the art form. And one of my favorites was, for example, a conversation between Jimmy Fallon, Lin-Manuel Miranda of Hamilton fame, and Weird Al Yankovic, in which the former two were interviewing Weird Al because they both really respected and revered him as they were coming up in their own careers. So that was a special sort of trifecta that you know, again, this virtual festival setting allowed us to produce. Yeah, we always hear about comedians when they start out, often if they're playing uh, places like the Ice House or whatever, you know, they meet each other and they encourage each other when they have a bad night or a good night. So it's interesting to hear how those lines crossed in those conversations. So, yes. You know, most every organization that I've talked to about how they handled COVID-19 says, hey, we learned things that we're going to take forward. So any idea when things are going to return to normal? I mean, we're just learning that the CDC isn't as concerned about surfaces, for example. So will some of these things that you're doing go forward or will you hopefully be able to go back to the way it was? That's a great question. I mean, for the time being, we are paying very close attention to any development, whether it comes to, you know, we talked about the virtual Lucy Ball Comedy Festival. Right now, that's still available for viewing online, and so I encourage people to go and, and uh, engage with that and visit us in town because the museum is back open. Right now, we are still operating with health and safety protocols uh, until we hear that it's safe to do otherwise. And, you know, I think like many organizations, we're wondering what might be here to stay. Uh, we actually found in some cases that people liked using a stylus versus touch, or, or maybe the exhibit uh, responded better to a stylus than fingers. And so that was an interesting, uh, unexpected development. So I think it's about empowering people to uh, approach things at their own comfort level. And if people want to continue to wear masks, for example, then, then we would support that. But right now, we still have the health and safety protocols in place. And no one has complained yet. Everybody sort of says, wow, I was able to relax and have a good time. And people continue to be blown away by what they, how much fun they have at the National Comedy Center Museum in Jamestown. Yeah, and relaxing and having a good time is certainly what it's all about. I may be forgetting about COVID-19 mm -hmm. for a little while. Well, when we come back, this is the 70th anniversary this year of I Love Lucy. We're going to talk about how Jamestown will mark that. Stay with us.
Today it's all about the National Comedy Center with Executive Director Journey Gunderson. So big anniversary of I Love Lucy this year, 70th anniversary. How will you celebrate this? Are there still a lot of decisions to make? Uh, we are, there's really never been a better time to visit Lucille Ball's hometown of Jamestown, the National Comedy Center, and the Lucille Ball Desiarnez Museum. As we mark 70 years since I Love Lucy, uh, if you just think, oh, I think I Love Lucy was a popular show, and, and I think Lucy was a funny actress in that, and wasn't that her husband who played Ricky Ricardo on the show? If that's the extent of your knowledge about I Love Lucy and Lucille Ball and Desiarnez, this is the year, this is the summer to come to Jamestown and explore because we've opened new galleries and new exhibits that tell that important legacy story. And I could spend 25 minutes at least just rattling off why that show was groundbreaking. Uh, I Love Lucy by several measures is one of the most successful sitcoms of all time. Just as an example, in 2012, ABC 20 and, uh, 2020 and People Magazine did a national poll in which I Love Lucy won in two categories, hmm. best TV comedy and best television show of all time, up against Cheers and Seinfeld and MASH and Friends. So um, in Jamestown, you can not only glimpse the iconic uh, polka dotted dress of Lucy, you can get into scenes from I Love Lucy. You can do the classic conveyor belt uh, candy wrapping <laughs> scene, and you can learn about how Desi Arnaz, um, a Cuban immigrant success story, revolutionized uh, television as we knew it at that time. So there is so much to celebrate about the I Love Lucy legacy and about Lucille Ball heading up Desi Lu Studios and becoming the first female head of a major Hollywood studio, the most powerful of its era. This is a legacy that's rich with stories and I encourage everyone to come to Jamestown and celebrate it. Yeah, and we're taking a look at the Lucy Museum here and the sets and things that are there. So people should know there's a Lucy part to the National Comedy Center, but there's a Lucy Museum uh, in and of itself. So great to visit. So for people who want to come and, and visit the Lucy Museum and the National Comedy Center, you know, how should they plan their visit? Uh, just visit comedycenter.org, and that's where you have the option to um, buy a dual admission ticket that allows you to take in both the Lucy Desi Museum and the National Comedy Center Museum during your stay. Um, and also make a reservation, again, for a time slot that works best for you. Uh, and I think it's something where right now during COVID, we're closed only on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so we're open Thursday. Uh, through Monday, and that may expand uh, as the pandemic continue, uh, the pandemic recovery and the vaccinations continue. Um, but right now we're open five days a week from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and you can go online at comedycenter.org and get your tickets. Um, we also do allow some space for walk-ins. All right, we are just down to the last couple of seconds, so celebrating the 70th of Lucy, we'll have to just watch and wait to see how you plan to handle that, depending on what happens with COVID-19. One word answer. <laughs> uh, We'll be producing wonderful programming in Jamestown one way or another. All right. Well, Journey Gunderson, it's been so great to have you here and catch up on what's happening at the National Comedy Center and, and really understand that visiting is still a possibility. And as always, thank you for joining us. If you have an idea you'd like us to explore on The Insider, just email me at Adams at erienewsnow.com and join us again next time for The Insider.